What are we about, Marcus? We're drifting. What? You and I are drifting apart. Hey, how is this about our relationship? Well, if we're up for something, if we're up for each other, now's when we've got to show it. By behaving like criminals? They're the criminals. They fit us up, they killed Julian, and there's nothing we can do. We need a soldier who can take the fight to the Look, film. We can't and fight knows anything from prison. I'm not afraid of prison, are you? It's a very bold statement, I'm not afraid of prison, right? Oh, you're not afraid of prison? No, it's a very statement? bold statement to make. Absolutely, yeah. it's a bold show. It's a bold show, yeah. The great John Ridley writing and directing the, the first two episodes. Does he write and direct the oh, whole no, series? Oh, no, he's written, uh, he wrote and directed, um, Okay, so he wrote five of the six episodes. He wow. directed three of the six episodes. Sam Miller did three, four, and five. John came back to film to shoot six. And Misan Sage wrote episode five. Misan wrote the movie Belle, mm -hmm. and um, she's done work on B for BBC television in, in, in the UK as well. Absolutely fantastic writer. I mean, you know, the, the, the thing about John Ridley is he's such... He's got this gift, which is... A very, very important gift to have in this industry where you can find and choose the right team to put together to create something like this because this is a brave and bold story, but you've got to find those brave and bold teammates in order to do it. And um, yeah, everything, he's so involved, he's so hands on. Um, yeah, he had a say in everything. For those of you who don't know, John Ridley is the writer of. Who doesn't know John Flame, Ridley? <laughs> creator of American Crime and just an all around uh, amazing, amazing guy, incredibly smart. Yeah. It's like. I'm sure you've you've spoken to him before. Multiple he's so, times, and every time I'm just in awe. I'm just like, he's so oh, meticulous, so right? Like he goes into so much detail, which is, I feel like sometimes when people are just so busy and they just want to get their job done, they 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 uh, skip all the, the the important bits, the in between the lines part. But John's not like that. John takes his own time to get to where we are. In fact, that scene, uh, I have a story behind. Can I share it? Of course. Um, so what would happen is uh, I would always be the first one to come on set and the last one to leave. And somehow or the other, the close-up on me would end up being the last thing of the day. So what happens is if you've ever been on a film set, they rush through towards the end. You know, you wait, 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 and then you go, oh my God, the day's coming to an end. We've got to wrap the scene. Okay, fine, get them in. Close-up. Okay, you have only two minutes left to do this and you better do it well. And that's a lot of pressure to have. Uh, we did the scene that night and it was like 2 a.m. or something like that. We did the scene kind of got rushed as usual. And um, we got it, we thought we had it. And John, you know, really pushed me. He really pushed me to get to um, where he really wanted the scene to go. And then as I was leaving, I just made a statement. I was like, why am I always right at the end? And I left. And then I get an email from John like 20 minutes after that when I was in the car. And he goes, if you would allow it, I would love to give you another, another go. Oh. And so the next day we started with that scene and he used that take without without uh, moving the camera. It was just like that one take on me that he just kept going. That's an incredible way to maintain trust with, the, with your director. Not many directors, I think, if right. any, would do something like Right, that. and I didn't, exp I didn't say I want to do it again. All I said was, why am I at the end of the day? Right. Always. Like a throwaway complaint, <laughs> and like you didn't even think about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, but he really gave, yeah, he, he said, he wrote such a beautiful email. He said, I want to do right by jazz, and I want to do right by you. Now, what I love about this show is it's uh, it's the story that we we often don't tell about those who were activists who ended up having to resort to violent activism because they were pushed so far against the wall, and the state the state's acts of violence against them were even more harsh and and atrocious. But we forget to talk about them, and they're often demonized because of their moments of, that are acts of violence, for for better or worse. That demonization, I won't make a statement about that. But where did where did you fall in telling this story? How did you feel about telling Telling a story about people who have incredible intentions, the best of intentions. And excuse where I'm coming from politically, I think it's the best of intentions. But they're back against the wall so hard they resort to violence, like the weather underground in, yeah. in the United States at the same time. Yeah. So one of the things to know about Guerrilla is that it is based on real life facts that did happen, um, uh, that followed the 1971 Immigration Act. And for those who don't know what the 1971 Immigration Act, by the way, which has still not been re repealed. What it was, uh, was that it, was, it stated that uh, all non-patrials, for the first time there was this, this term patrials and non-patrials. Patrials were uh, um, people whose parents or grandparents were born in Australia, New Zealand, or South Africa, uh, and non-patrials were people who migrated to England from the colonies, Africa and Asia in particular. Uh, and the Immigration Act stated that all non-patrials were now at the risk of deportation because they 
um, but not technically not British enough, you know, and there was an immigration act being, being surfacing at that point in time. So really the movements that um, uh, came from it, this is the black power movement that I'm talking about, was a protest against this immigration act because those who migrated to England pretty much thought that they were coming to their motherland as, as part of the colonies they served in World War I and II. Uh, they worked for the British. They, the queen was their, their queen as well. And they thought they were going to motherland only to realize that, hey, they were not welcome. Um, and so the protest really was very literary. They had this, this um, publication called Race Today, and they used uh, literature as well. There were few acts of violence, but not so much. But what we do with Gorilla is, uh, what John r rather did with Gorilla was he took the creative liberty to make it a, a what-if drama. What if the 1971 Immigration Act, uh, um, uh, Black Power Movement got radicalized? And really what he's saying is, he's talking about what's really happening today. You know, we're really at the moment being pushed up against a wall in many ways. There are lots How of- How does something get politically radical radicalized? What does that look like when that happens? Why does that happen? And it's questions that aren't asked enough because when you talk, when political movements got radicalized at a certain point, I mean, leftist political movements, right. they are demonized and swept under the rug and right. their political stances for the most part are thought to be deplorable because of the stance they took or how they took that stance. Exactly. And that's what the show really, you know, throws some light on. And that's why I guess, you know, you take this creative liberty to in order to, to, show, to show that part as well. And really, uh, Babu says this fantastic thing as well, you know, because he is from Gambia and uh, there's a lot of political unrest in Gambia at the moment with his family um, you know, the, the lives, just say lives generally under a lot of threat in, in Gambia. And he goes, how far would you go when you are backed up against a wall and it's the lives of your loved ones that are at risk? How far would you go to defend them? And it really is, you know, when uh, up until we are in that situation, and kind of we are. If you're being ignorant about it, then that'd be really sad. Yeah, but Gambia, we, I mean, Gambia, the political unrest might be a bit more extreme, but we're seeing. No, no, I mean, we're, we're there. politically uh, political unrest all, all over the place right now. Absolutely, and there's a um, lot of things being said and done that are very dangerous to um, just civil rest in this in this country in America, uh, in general. So I kind of feel like you know it's time to wake up and and talk about it and do something about it and not just talk about it. And that's what I love my character. She's the doer. She doesn't want to talk about it anymore. She wants to be able to do something about it. I think in regards to the political unrest right now, not to harp on this too much, but uh, what we see are two different responses to the political unrest happening across the world, which is the sort of left moving further left, which I'm okay with really, <laughs> personally, and the right moving further towards a kind of nationalism, which pushes the left even further left and sort of creates a, a, a a, a violent world in, in in many ways, which is kind of where guerrilla comes from. At the same time, they're fighting the the National Front in the in the UK at the time. Yeah, the National Front was, uh, and thank you for bringing bringing that up. That came into prominence in the 1970s. You know, uh, the 1960s had its own movement already against racism and against uh, injustices um, and fighting for equal pay as well. But the 19 in 1970s, specifically after the Rivers of Blood speech and uh, and 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 after the Immigration Act, it became Came even more uh, powerful and and you're right it's a lot of it came from ignorance and the lack of understanding this is on the part of the National Front as well because they were not ev even aware uh, of the fact that the co people from the colonies were actually welcomed to come to England to work and to find jobs that suited their qualifications which by the way they were very educated and very qualified those who came from the colonies but when because of who they were, you know, once upon a time colonized, they were relegated to uh, lower paying jobs and not really jobs that suited their qualifications. And John does a wonderful job of weaving that story into the sort of greater action of, of the script. There's that great monologue that one of the police uh, captains, not, maybe he's not a police captain, but the main character that's- Rory Kinnear. Place, yeah, yeah, Rory yeah. Kinnear gives yeah. uh, in the police station in the second episode, there's the, the scene with Babu being uh, incredibly qualified, but only given the, the job of a driver. He's so great at telling the story without exposition. You that know? is so true, and I'm so glad you pointed that out because it could easily go down the path where it just becomes a documentary of, of sorts. 
uh, which is just then information, information, information. But what he does with this is he goes into, you know, that's the other thing about revolutions and wars and, and uh, refugees. We forget that they're not numbers. They're real lives, they're real stories, they're real emotions that run beneath it all. And what John does is instead of just... Um, uh, surface, um, treating it at the surface, he really delves deep into the emotions of it all, and he touches upon all these subject matters. And later on, as you see in episodes three, four, and five, you'll also see the dynamics of jazz in this underground cell. So as is, she's already fighting this bigger, greater cause uh, to not be repatriated and to retain her um, uh, identity, her identity in England. And on the other hand, within her community and within her underground cell that she uh, belongs to now, she's fighting a kind of misogyny, you know, which, where they're all men making the rules and she's the only lone female who's constantly been asked to shut up till she realizes I'm not going to shut up and I'm going to I'm going to make sure that they pay attention to me. Um, and so I think he's delved with uh, into subject matters that we all face in any revolution in day to day life even. Um, and he does it so uh, he's not heavy handed at all. Oh, I've, I've never thought John Ridley to be heavy handed. What was it like working on this show, shooting it, looking at the material in the midst of the political chaos? Not chaos, but chaos, chaos. unrest <laughs> that we're seeing across the chaos if you read Twitter, but <laughs> unrest if you just look at the rest of the world. There was a little bit of chaos with the uncertainty for sure, because when we finished, when we started filming, sorry, when we started filming, um, Brexit just happened. And there was this kind of like, so what does this mean? What is Brexit? What does it really mean for the people who have migrated to, to England uh, in, in the hopes of a better job? And We don't know, we, says Britain. <laughs> exactly. But that's exactly the uncertainty that creates that kind of chaos. And then people without the information, without the knowledge of what it really means are, um, you know, um, um, make their own, draw their own conclusions, which creates more unrest and which creates more chaos. So we kind of felt that on set every day because even on set, the actors would, we discuss it amongst ourselves. We talk to our crew members and no one knows what it means, but everyone has a theory. And we use that kind of, um, uh, the uncertainty, but also for us as actors, uh, the confusion of it all, we injected it into our characters because really Jazz and Marcus don't really know what they're doing, but they know what they're doing it for. They're doing it for because they stand for something and they believe in something, but they're not really sure what their actions are going to really lead to and there are consequences. No matter if you think you're on the side of good or the side of wrong, there are consequences any which way. So we kind of used that, uh, that cluelessness, the rawness, the, the, the fight in us to want to know more, to do more, uh, into our characters, and it was really helpful, actually. What I love about the story of, uh, of these characters is that because they get back to New Wall and because they resort to a certain type of activism, suddenly they become criminalized in many ways, and they have to operate within a criminal world. So even though that goes against maybe their beliefs as activists, that's the only way they can finance their lives at this point and, and, and their activities. Yeah, I mean, you know, isn't that true for two people having a conversation? You have an opinion, I have an opinion. I strongly believe in my opinion, you strongly believe in yours. And we have to find any which way to, to say, no, I, I don't agree with you. And especially if it goes against my beliefs and against my very system, you know, you kind of... And then what happens in, in that situation is if we are like the left and the right, like going in, well, two opposite directions we are going to criminalize the other. So in this, you know, in the first scene when she says, they are the criminals, it's not us. They see them, they view Jazz and Marcus as violent, uh, unruly people who are uh, a burden on society. And what Jazz and Marcus strongly believe they're doing is that they are creating a safer, more uh, friendlier, more welcome environment for their people. And um, what John does in this show is he does not create the good guy and the bad guy. Uh, Jazz and Marcus are not good, they're not bad. Uh, the Black Power Desk are not good, they're not bad because they have their own sets of beliefs which we may not agree with, but that's fine because that's who we are as humans to have different sets of beliefs as long as you're not harming a human life and as long as you're not taking their basic right to just be who they are and be whoever they want to be away from them. Now, I feel like since you uh, rose to prominence with maybe Slumdog Millionaire and just a little bit before that, you've been... Only Slumdog Millionaire. No. It was my first film. <laughs> I had um, nothing before that. Well, you modeled a little bit, right? Well, come on. That's not prominence. I'm just trying to dig myself out of the ditch that I dug. <laughs> uh, you've, 
been very involved in humanitarian efforts, at least as much as it seems like you, you could be involved. Is it important for you or was it important for you to have a project like this as well, something that could sort of in, in some way express, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say your political beliefs, but would be political and would be about humanitarian issues? I think way before this series even came on, and I think that might have been partly one of the reasons why why John was even you know probably interested in in, in exploring uh, me to play jazz. It's sort of under the assumption that you would have an opinion and that you would have you exactly know. because the, our first meeting was all about that was about opinions was about what I believe in and uh, and as I talked to him about things that I stand up for and I speak I, I'm very vocal about things that I believe in and even if it means that sometimes it might. Uh, attract <laughs> uh, attention that you don't necessarily want to get a, one in your life, but you know I don't care because I'm I'm I, like I said I stand up for something I believe in, and that really helped me um, in playing this role as well. Uh, I told John this really funny story about me in the eighth grade. Um, I told him much later actually. Um, the librarian in our uh, school had kind of banned or you know kept a certain section of the books away from the eighth grade. It was an author called Judy Bloom, who's a young adult novelist, and uh, I had read her books in the seventh grade, and there were books, her books were available for the ninth grade as well, but I was like, why is it not available for the eighth grade? I just don't get it. Like, I don't understand. So I walk up to the librarian, and I say, I don't understand. I love Judy Bloom. Why can't I have, why don't I have access to these books? And he goes, those are not for you. It's for the higher grade. So when you get to the ninth grade, you can get them. And I go, but I don't understand. Like, can you give me an explanation why? But there was no explanation. It was, you know, a sense of authority and power. So I go back to my class, and, and I was always a leader, and I said, hey, guess what? None of us are going to library class today. It's our protest. We won't go because he won't get, give us the books. And he was so angry. He called the principal, and the, the principal came to class, and she goes, who did this? Like, why aren't you in library class? You're supposed to be there. And I, I said, well, I'm, you know, I, he wouldn't let us read Judy Bloom, and I don't understand why he won't give us an explanation. She kind of smiled and she said, well, next time you have a problem like that, you come and talk to me, but don't do this. Like, don't have ban the entire class from going to library class. And she smiled where somewhere deep down she knew that I was somewhere on the side of right. At least an explanation would have helped on why. Uh, poor librarian. I've, like, brought him up so many times in this, in this press tour. Uh, um, has, has, has being outspoken for any particular issue that you're involved in or interested in uh, gotten you unwanted attention since, yeah. you, since you've gotten, you know, famous, for lack of a better word? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I say things that I believe in. Like, for example, the plight of women in India, and I talk about it quite openly. Uh, I'm not just saying that it's just India, but there are other countries in the world as well where women are not uh, treated with dignity and respect. But in India, it affects me more because, guess what? I am Indian. So I speak openly about it on a, uh, on a public platform, and sometimes that irks my fellow countrymen because they feel it's, it's like mudslinging, but it really isn't mudslinging. It's all about just awareness and accepting. There is a deep-rooted problem in my country, and we have to address it. So those are the kind of troubles I get into, but it doesn't stop me. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, questions from you guys, the audience, who right here. Hi, Frida. How are you? Hi. I wanted to ask you, by being in a movie of this magnitude, what awareness have you gained, and what impact has it made? Right. I think um, with Gorilla, um, there was a lot of things I did not know. Uh, and one of them would be, would be the actual historical events. So when I had my first meeting with John, it was obviously to meet John Ridley and to tell him that I really wanted to be part of it uh, and to play jazz, but also in a way to verify the authenticity of, of the facts that he had written in the pilot episode. Um, I don't know if you were aware of the Black I was, I was not. Right? It's like it's not documented. It's, we don't learn that. And I grew up learning world history, but for some reason, the 70s history was never that. You know, we were never told about that. The Black Panther movement, yes, like widely, widely studied in the civil rights movement in America, widely studied. We're kind of taught that civil rights was gained by, like, the 70s at some point. You know, yeah. I mean, widely gained. We know, I mean, those of us who are sort of like read enough history, know that that's not entirely true. true but I think true, yeah. in basic historical teachings, basic classes, you're yeah. kind of taught that there was Martin Luther King and then everybody was free. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. What happened before that? <laughs> um, but, yes, yeah, so this was, if for me, it was more of a, uh, um, a, an educational process where I really learned about the actual historical events that led to all these uh, wide protests. And the other things that I learned was that the 
British uh, black power movement drew a lot of inspiration from the British Black Panther movement and the 60s and the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, I think, Martin Luther King and Muhammad Ali did a lot of uh, lectures, um, gave a lot of lectures in England. So um, that also really inspired revolutionaries like Darkus Howe and Leela Howe, uh, Farouk Donde, who my character has, uh, is based on. The other thing that uh, I, you know, I think America is a little shocked and surprised, like, this is the first question that came up, right? Why is an Indian playing the lead in a black power movement. And that's because in England, if you are not on the side of the people who are gaining things, if you are on the side of the people who are being suppressed, if you were Asian, Asian being Indian or coming from any other part of the colonized uh, world, you were black. So there is a line which we is not in the series right now, but in an improv where I just said, with the character was like, you know, we're fighting for blacks, we're fighting for Indians. I'm like, it's fine, you can just call me black, it's fine. <laughs> so if you're not on the side of the other color, you are black, no matter what the color of your skin is. You could be Irish and pale, and you're still black. Yeah. It's, so it's a political blackness more than the color of your skin. Next question. Hi, Frida. Hi. Uh, fascinating. I can't <sighs> wait. I mean, Yay. I'm English, as you can hear, and I, I, some of this I know, some of this I've heard about. I love your passion. I was actually just going to ask you a very fluffy question and yeah. say, you've played with such gorgeous leading men. I mean... <laughs> no, who's next? I mean, oh, who's next? <laughs> rest on your laurels oh now. You're God. booked. It's done. I'm really lucky, I have to say. I do work with Idris not Elba. just gorgeous oh Idris Elba. <laughs> Uh, not just not just gorgeous men, uh, uh, but also great directors, you know, who are just gorgeous in a different way. I'm not like, you know, not staring at them and drooling, but, <laughs> but, but definitely um, gorgeous in talent. And I'm so just, yeah, I feel like, and with all these gorgeous men that you talk about, you know, two of the men that stand out to me right now as I speak to you are probably Christian Bale and Idris Elba. They're such seasoned actors and the first thing you would expect is because, you know, they could make you really nervous for being in this industry forever since, it, since the time they were kids, um, definitely for Christian Bale. You would think that they would make you super nervous, but that's just not who they are. As soon as you are in their presence, it's just all inclusive, no hierarchy. We're all the same. We're all here to do the same job. And that's what Idris did on the first day. So Idris and I had all our scenes in the first two weeks because he was moving on to shoot another film. Um, and I was so nervous because I was like, wait a minute, I'm like starting with one of my biggest scenes with, with Kent, with Idris Elba, and I like, had no other prep, I've not worked with any of the other actors, you know, and, oh my God, I'm so nervous, but I didn't want to, you know, let Idris know that I was that nervous, so I'm like standing there, I'm like, I'm oh, really cool, I've got this one, and then he stops right before we start filming, and he goes, stop, so I just want to say something, and he comes and gives me this massive hug, and he says, I'm so honored to be working with you, I can't wait to do this with you. And as soon as he said that, I was just so relaxed. I was like, okay, now we're you know, on the same level. We're doing this together. So yeah, I think people like Idris just make, you know, aren't you like loving him even more now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got a hug from Idris Elba? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question right here. Um, the timing of this movie coming out, I think, is pretty uh, amazing, considering we have a real populist movement going on around the world and with the election of Donald Trump. And even the, the ad that is promoting it, you utter these very, very powerful words, power to the people. Mm -hmm. And I think that in an era where people are losing the power, I'm just curious, when you're doing a movie like this and you see what's going around you politically, What's going on in your head? How do you feel about today's uh, politics and what's happening around the world? Do you want to rewind to like a couple of, uh, to... to question one? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I have, I'll just, I'll make this really simple. I don't believe in neutrality in given the fact that we are in this very, very tough time right now in the world. And I don't believe in not speaking up. Uh, and I don't believe there is time for neutrality right now. It's an urgent time and we have to be able to speak up and stand up for what we believe in, because if we don't, you won't have that right anymore. So that's, that's how I feel about the political situation, not just in America, but everywhere in the world. And almost is, for me, feels like a responsibility to, as a uh, global citizen, and not just a citizen of my country, to be able to speak up for humanity in different parts of the world. Like, you know, we can't be forgetting about other 
things that have happened in the last couple of years just because our focus right now is on someone's Twitter account. You know, and I think that sometimes is really deflecting and distracting from what is really, really going on. Uh, <laughs> who else's Twitter account is the most interesting right now, I guess? Like, everyone's, like, you know, using that on talk shows, and it's in the media. I'm talking about it now. It's, yeah, so for me, there is no time for neutrality. Yeah, I also think there's a, sorry, I don't need to get, make my opinions known. But no, I, but make I, it known. Uh, Said it, you have I, I to stand up. A, I think, there's, I think there's, a, there's a poor definition of populism that's going on and power to the people. There is someone who ran off of a populist campaign and said that he was giving power to the people, but he's not. And it was never a part of it. And there is actually a growing populism in this country amongst a lot of working people that is not something to frown upon. And it is something to look at and shine a light on and help, which is not what the person who ran a quote unquote populist campaign is actually doing. Yep. Uh, Frida, before I let you go, I want to ask you one more question about your career. Uh, you mentioned Christian Bale. It was in a Terrence Malick movie that yeah. you worked with him. I love Terrence Malick so much. I, I don't let a person go if they, without answering a question about working That's with Terrence Malick. Malick. Okay. Yeah. So what was it like working with, with Terrence Malick? Ha, huh, okay. Or get a scripted line to, to say. Um, I had a bunch of pages that were given to me. Uh, they were not lines, but they were just uh, words. And they were Terry's words um, that he came up, the night, came up with the night before. And he just types them. By the way, he types them out. It's not typed on a computer, but he types them out on a typewriter. Uh, and I got these type words. Um, and I just kind of like read them. And I was like, what am I reading? because I have no idea where they, for me, it came out of context, right? But as I was on set the next day, I realized that as we were moving in time along the day, I could just find some of those words coming to use, you know? I was just using them, using sentences, using sentences like, uh, this is not for me. It's something as simple as that. And it totally would start making sense, because we're talking about, you know, the story of, uh, Knight of Cups is He's giving you an internal monologue, basically, yeah, like run through your head, yeah, exactly. So cool. yeah. And I say this line: I wreak havoc in men's lives, and uh, which I was like, Ooh, pretty cool line. <laughs> I have all the cool lines in all the movies, but um, uh, but but I, it started making sense as we move along. And for me, Terry is Terence is not just a um, not just a director. For me, he's a guide. You know, he's like my psychological guide as well. He's taking me through every scene. And uh, there was this one moment where. Uh, he, he walks up to me between takes and he goes, oh, you don't seem like the kind of person who seeks validation. And I looked at him and said, do you know what I do for a living? <laughs> All I do is seek validation. <laughs> uh, and he goes, no, 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 I, I don't think you understand what I'm saying, but you don't seem like that kind of a person. He goes, okay, just imagine for the next couple of moments that you don't, you don't need validation. And then the camera starts rolling. And then all of a sudden I feel so empowered because I don't care if anyone's opinion around me and not even... Rick, uh, Christian's character Rick in it, that it kind of ended up making sense in the final cut. So you just have to trust and go along with someone like Terrence Malick. Frida, it's been wonderful having you here. Gorilla is absolutely fantastic. I can't fait, wait to finish watching it. It premieres uh, April 16th? Yep. April 16th on Showtime. Frida Pinto, everybody, thank you so much for being here. <laughs>